Uh, the current kit that I'm assembling here involves the winding of several uh, transformers on binocular cores like this one installed on the board and also winding several toroidal inductors. Uh, it's just a bare toroid I have in my hands. So I thought to just do a quick video on how to uh, wind a toroid. The uh, toroid cores themselves are color coded. Uh, these red ones are a type 2. Uh, yellow is often a type 6 like those over there. And the material uh, really determines the frequency range that the core can be used over. It will also have an influence on how much inductance you're going to get for a given number of turns. The toroids will also have a, be identified by a code. Like This is a T30-2. The T meaning toroid, the 30 meaning 3 tenths of an inch in outer diameter, and the dash 2 is the material type. Uh, there's lots of tables you can find by simply googling on the internet to uh, get all kinds of information about uh, how many, uh, how much inductance you're going to get per turn, how many inches of wire per turn you're going to need, you know, for a given core size and type. So uh, we're just going to wind uh, one of the toroids that is uh, listed here in the assembly instructions for this Ensemble 2 software defined receiver. The trickiest part about winding these toroids is holding them when you're fishing the wire through and trying to keep everything tight and do it all with just uh, your fingers because these toroids can often be quite small. So there's a couple of different methods that you can use to hold these when you're actually making the windings. Uh, QRP Me uh, website sells these nifty little uh, tools I think they were designed by uh, another amateur that allows you to clamp those toroids in a little slot and uh, you can put that into a vise and then use that uh, kind of hands-free to uh, to wind the core and uh, I haven't really used these yet uh, because I've been using a, a different method uh, for winding cores and I'll show you that I've been using a um, tapered wooden dowel. This is actually the end of a uh, an old chopstick and uh, you may have to taper this or shave it down depending on the size of the toroid you're using but the toroid can sit right over there and uh, as you push it down on there it can be used to kind of really hold the windings in place as you slip the wires through. So I found this works really well especially if you can clamp it into something that is uh, fairly stationary like this nice heavy uh, a machinist vise that I have here. When winding a toroidal core, each pass of the wire through the core, like that one pass just like that, that's considered one turn, even though it isn't completely all the way around the, wire, the, the uh, core there. So uh, when I wind these, I like kind of drawing the wire through my fingers, kind of doing this off camera here, to take all the kinks out of the wire, and then just arch it around and bring it down here for the next turn. The first couple are the trickiest ones because the wire isn't tight yet and it's going to want to all walk around on you here. So you just want to carefully dress that wire through and pull that next turn in and try to lay it adjacent to the previous turn. So Once you get uh, two or three turns on here, things will tend to want to stay, stay in place. So there's uh, two turns and we'll run the next one in here and again they kind of get easier as you move along. And I like to kind of push the core up and then uh, even bend the wire a little bit so as I push it down it uh, it comes around and I can very easily grab it. And you want to be sure that you don't tie the the wire in knots as you do this. So if you work slowly you can build yourself up a rhythm and uh, put some nice neat turns onto that core. So with uh, about half the turns on here, I've got about 17 turns on here now of the 35 I need to wind. It's a good time to you know, take a look at what you've got, make sure they're you know, relatively evenly spaced, nothing's overlapping, and uh, once you're satisfied with that, you can continue on. And again, uh, as you go along here, you kind of get a little bit of a rhythm built up, and the, uh, the windings actually go pretty quickly and pretty smoothly. Of course, I stopped to turn the camera on here, so I... I broke my rhythm a little bit, but uh, that's not too bad. And there's uh, 18. And the biggest trick sometimes is to make sure that you keep your count straight, because uh, going back afterwards to count these windings is a little bit tedious. OK, 
Okay, and there's all uh, 35 turns. You can just kind of go through here and try to evenly space those. And uh, that doesn't look too bad. The next thing we'll do is uh, tin the leads, get the uh, insulation off. And uh, we can make a measurement of this to be sure that uh, we got the inductance right. Now one way to strip the uh, enamel off of this type of wire is with some fine sandpaper. Here's a bit of a fold of some 400 grit sandpaper. And if you grab the wire and pull and draw across a couple times, you'll eventually just abrade the uh, enamel away. You can kind of see how the color is changing a little bit there as we do this. And it just takes a couple of passes. And you can see how we're kind of rubbing that off there. And that will generally work, but uh, oftentimes there may be another way that may uh, work out a little bit now, better. Many of these uh, enamel coated wires are heat strippable. And you can heat them up with a, uh, a flame of some sort and just uh, sand the ash away. Or oftentimes you can even just uh, bury the wire in a ball of solder. And that's what I like doing here. And uh, you bury it in the solder, it just kind of boils away the enamel. And as you draw the wire across, with a solder across, it just creates a nice tinned wire. And uh, this doesn't work for all of the epoxy types that you'll find on these wires, but for the type that I'm using here, it works really well. Right. With uh, the toroid wound and both of the wires uh, tinned with the epoxy coating taking off, uh, we can optionally go and measure this inductor to be sure it uh, measures appropriately. Uh, it'll also give us a verification that we got the number of turns on here correct. And to measure the inductor, we'll turn the uh, meter on here. And uh, it's going to be a relatively small value, so I want to zero out uh, my meter. So put it in the inductance measurement mode. I'm just going to insert a short little jumper wire in here and uh, hit the zero button to uh, zero that out. And uh, so now I can pull that out and we'll insert our test inductor, or the one that we just wound. I kind of jammed it on the end of the uh, my winding stick here and that will allow me to you know kind of position this thing and actually you know stick the wires into the fixture and hold it in place without uh, having my fingers on the coil which might affect the inductance so if we take a look at it I'm reading uh, oh about 5.18 or about 5.2 microhenries it was designed to be 5.5 so that's uh, you know less than 10 percent off that's certainly going to be sufficient uh, for the job so that one inductor is done. I've only got about another 10 or 12 to do for this kit. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed uh, the video. Learned a little something about uh, how to wind a toroidal inductor. Some of the precautions you might want to take and methods you could use. And uh, thanks again for watching.